today, what I wanted to do was get Alexi to talk about this idea of building relationships by creating content and uh, just understanding how that you can build, you know, into becoming a welcome guest rather than an annoying pest when it comes to your email marketing or through your nurture sequence. So, Alexi, I might hand over to you and get you to do a bit of a cover the bits that I didn't cover. Yeah, cool. Um, thanks for that. So um, what we're going to be talking about today, let me do a screen share here, one sec. And you guys can see my slides. We're good. Mm -hmm. All right, beautiful. So how to create killer content that gets you clients and sales. That's our subject matter. And when David and I chatted a few weeks ago in preparation for this presentation, we just ran through some of the things I really need to hit on given his, his clientele, his database, his audience, and so forth. And so today we're going to dig into um, a whole range of things to do with content, why content matters, why it's important, the value of content in terms of getting clients and sales. Uh, we're going to talk about three biggest mistakes that everybody makes in their business when it comes to content. One of those is being stuck for ideas, and I'll show you how to get around that nice, nice and easy. And then we'll talk about how you can use content and pitch at the same time. Okay. So uh, now Dave's preempted me by asking the question, how many people are you know, sending regular emails to the list and uh, not many hands were raised. So this is both good and bad. It's bad because you should be doing it. It's good because there's found money on the table. And I'll show you in a bit the potential, uh, the potential for you, depending on the size of your list. Now, first, why content? So let me just throw some numbers at you because... It's it's it, more than almost more than anything else that I can think of. It's found money for little to no risk. So according to demand metric, content marketing costs sixty two percent less than traditional marketing, and generates about three times as many leads. And according to Aberdeen, uh, conversion rates are nearly six times higher for content marketing adopters than non adopters. So an example of that would be and you've got your own experience to validate this is uh, how often have you bought um, you know, like a bigger ticket product, not like a $20 pen or something, a bigger ticket product product, or even joining Dave's program, Dave's program, um, like where you bought on the spot versus, you know, you're just being on the list for a bit, following them on social, listening to their podcasts, enjoying their material before you started to feel confidence and trust that a, a deeper conversation or a purchase is, is, is imminent. And this is what this is really saying. The point is, um, let me get Kevin into the room. Um, with content, it builds trust and via trust sales get easier versus running ads straight to a pitch to people that have never seen or heard about you before, okay? So Aberdeen are saying it's six times higher. I would hazard a guess that it's, it's much higher even than that. I would suspect it's 10, 15, 20, 30 times higher for those people, those companies that are using content to first warm up prospects and then follow up with pitching. Yeah. Now, companies that publish 16 plus blog posts per month, which is a ton, by the way, almost none of our clients do that, <laughs> get almost three and a half times more traffic compared to those that do zero to four. The point here is the more that you do, the more that you get. Uh, of course, that presupposes it's still quality. You don't just do garbage. And this one's my favorite and it sort of dovetails to a degree with this, this stat back here about the conversion rates. And that is, you know, according to Demand Gen report, about half of buyers viewed three to five pieces of content before engaging with a sales rep. And traditional advertising methods no longer work as well as they used to. And this is absolutely true. Now, if we're talking traditional advertising, we're not really talking newspaper ads and radio anymore. We're talking Facebook ads and, and the like. And anybody who's been running ads for a while and, and so forth knows, man, 10 years ago, it was so easy to get leads and clients from Facebook ads. Now it's it's orders of magnitude more complicated and you have to be much more skilled. Uh, but having said that, if you take the, if you put the effort of investment and time and thought into producing content, regular content, and warming people up and having the patience and the willingness to just slow down to go fast and let people qualify themselves via content, via good, good education when they are ready. And we'll talk more about what's involved with that in a moment. When they are ready to have the conversation because your content 
has sufficiently built enough trust and given them enough value for them to start to conclude in their own mind, yeah, I'm ready to speak to David about his program or I'm ready to speak to Alexi and the team about their content marketing services. And then that, those conversations, this is what, not what's reflected in this statistic, those conversations are easy. They're warm. They're effortless. They're, they're not hard selling. It's all the good things that we like to <laughs> experience in, in sales. And it's a mutually enjoyable experience for salesperson and prospect and all. Okay. So I could throw at you many more reasons and many more stats around why content marketing matters so much, but uh, I won't do that. We'll continue on here and I'll show you some other ways to think about content and then how to create great content. Now, this pyramid that you see here, I did not invent this. I first saw this, I think, um, in a book called The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. Um, write that book down. It's easily a top five book on sales. Um, for me, I've read you know plenty of books on the subject. And in that book, Chet talked about this, this triangle, and it's a good way to think about one's market. And so let's go through this because it dovetails with the content very nicely. So at any one time, you've got the apex of the, of the triangle here, 3% of your market that are actively buying, right? They're, they've got their wallet out. They're looking for a provider and they're just willing to spend money. Think the household owner that has a burst pipe it's flooding the downstairs bedroom and they're in a, a shit situation. They, they, they don't want to see content. Don't want, they, they need the solution solved now, 3%, okay? Now, if you look at this, um, most companies, most businesses, and this is the absurdity of this, really only want to talk to the 3%. They put all their efforts into and they, they, they assume anybody that they come across is at the 3%. And they treat everybody the same. And this is where we get hard selling happening. This is where we get displeasure happening in the, in the sales transaction and, and yada, yada, yada. But it's only 3% of the market, meaning 97% of their market, they're not really thinking about, focused about, even catering towards. But if you go down this triangle, the next level, and this is where content marketing starts to enter the picture, is you can double your market size instantly. Double it by starting to think about and talking to those that are open and interested, but they're just not ready to pull the trigger yet, right? They're actively searching, you know, they're, they're, they're warm leads, they're, they're, they're great prospects. They just need some support to spend money with you, right? Now, these people at the 6 to 7% require different messaging, different dialogue, different thought, different process than the people at the 3%. Yet almost nobody even really thinks this through in business. They just want to keep thinking about 3%. And therefore, constrain their sales, therefore, constrain the size of their business, therefore, constrain their success. But with just a bit of lateral thinking, a bit of broad mindedness, you can easily double the size of your market. And these are still extremely hot prospects. Now, we go down the pyramid a bit more. Okay, this is where we can 10 times the size of our market. Now, admittedly, these people are not ready to buy now. These people are not even actively searching for a solution, they've got peripheral interests. Think the Think the 38-year-old uh, full-time employed professional that maybe just had a kid and starting to think about uh, financial future, starting to think about their kid's financial future, and now looking into the efficacy of what do I do for my kids? How do I invest my money? And they just start looking into investing in property. They're not ready to buy. They're not, they haven't got their finance sorted. They haven't got any of that stuff, but they're starting to fish around. Okay. Now, if you're selling property, if you're selling property education services or something like that, you want that person in your world. You, what you don't want to be doing is treating them like the 3% at the top. You want them in your world because they're at a stage now where they're looking for options, just getting their education sorted. Here's the thing. If you are willing to invest the time and the energy to pr provide value to that individual via email content, via, via content on social, via a podcast, whatever it may be, and have the patience to let themselves go from being in the 30% I'm not thinking about it category to the point where they get moved themselves up to open interested but not actually buying, i.e. warm leads. If you have earned the right via content, via education, via moving the value line to be in front of them when they move themselves up to the next stage in the pyramids, well, I mean, 
when they're actively looking to have conversations now, you're going to be at the top of the list of the company they're going to have the first chat to amongst the first. Now, that could be in reality, they're probably on multiple email lists. They're probably following a few people, right? So they probably will have multiple conversations at the point where they're 6 or 7%, this point here, the second point from the top. But the point is you want to be at the front of that line. The way you get to the front of that line when they are ready is by producing regular, consistent content, but also by not treating them like the 3% at that stage, by not haranguing them with buy this, buy that, buy the other thing, because they're just going to unsubscribe. They're just going to comment negatively on your social posts, right? So you need to be sensible about where a particular prospect is in their life cycle, so to speak. But the point is this, if you can start to broaden your thinking and start to think, okay, the people that are, are, are the, I'm not thinking about it market right now. They've got some level of interest. It's low. If you can stay, if you can be willing to start to talk to these people, you literally 10 X the size of your market. That's number one. Number two, when they move themselves up this pyramid, you have earned the right and you've earned the trust to have a conversation with them. When they move themselves up to this point, you're going to be amongst the first, ideally the first that they reach out to and say, hey, been on your list for a while, been following your podcast, loving your stuff. I'm looking to do X. Can we have a chat? Okay. And now that conversation is absurdly easy and enjoyable. This is compared to not doing any of this. Okay. And finding this person, uh, say via cold ads, where they don't know you, they're at this point here and you're haranguing them to have a conversation. They do have the conversation. But if they don't know you, don't trust you, haven't heard about you before, and you have the chat with them when they're at this point, open, interested, it's a much harder sale. It's a much more costly sale. It's a less enjoyable sale as well. Okay. Now, I see we have 20-ish people. So what I'm going to do, um, we've got an hour together. I'm 10 minutes in. When we've got smaller groups, i.e. not like 1,000 people, <laughs> I like to do pit stops for Q&As. So if you guys want to pop any questions in here, I'll do a quick pit stop and answer any questions. If you guys don't pop anything in, that's totally fine. But I found with smaller groups, it's helpful to do the pit stops so I don't overwhelm people too much with, you know, good stuff. Any questions? Well, yep. while we're getting those questions in the chat box, it just resonated a few things with me because only, only about a month ago, I had exactly the experience you talked about where I've got someone that said, hey, we've been following your content for the past 10 years. 10 years. 10 years. <laughs> And we're ready. And it's like, wow. Yeah, you know, yeah. and they said, you know what? Your content has been great, especially, you know, we use your emails in our in our board meetings. And I'm sitting there scratching my head, going, which ones? Yeah. <laughs> and they go, I don't know which ones, I can't remember. But yeah. what you described there is spot on because what, what it is is that uh, you're building a relationship over time. Yeah. Uh, and I don't believe you can ever make someone buy your product. I don't think yeah. you can force someone to buy. So being really good at sales doesn't mean knowing how to close a person who doesn't want to buy. It means understanding where they are in that buying cycle and meeting them where they're at. Yeah, correct. Agreed. Okay, so I don't see anyone's got any questions. That's totally, totally cool. Let's keep mushing along here. So um, now David just mentioned about that, that client that was on the list for 10 years. And that, and that is a perfect segue, and we did not stage this. That's a perfect segue to, to the point I was going to make next, and that is the 1% rule. Um, now, now, look, we've, we've, we've worked with thousands of companies, right? So I intimately understand the frustrations with content and why companies and businesses don't do it, right? One of those is the effort and the time it takes to get payback, okay? You're producing content, you're producing content, and you're scratching your head, is the content paying for itself? Is it successful? Is it winning? Is it justifiable here for all the effort? And this is where I want to talk about the 1% rule. The 1% rule is just a very much general rule of thumb to apply to most businesses. It can vary, and you'll see on the next slide how it varies, where you can say, um, if I am diligently producing content and the content is good and I'm consistent, right? We're not talking slop here. We're talking good stuff, consistent. What you can safely guesstimate is sometime in the next year, 1% of your audience will convert. Okay, so let's qualify what I mean by that. Let's say you've got 5,000 people, say, on your email list. 
the email list is a really good channel to use for this example because um, unlike social where Facebook and Twitter and the like, they can throttle reach. You never know who's seeing what. With email, you can see by and large, notwithstanding the, the spam folder and the promotions folder, but you can, you can see you get decent visibility into how many people are opening your emails, how many people are clicking and so forth. So if you've got 5,000 people on your email list, you can assume, again, if your content's good and you're consistent, 1% of those people will convert into well, buyers, will do something. So what's 1% of 5,000? 10% is 500, 1% is 50. So if you've got 10%, yeah, just validating that one. So you can assume over the next year, 50 people on your email list approximately will turn into buyers. And so now where this gets exciting is if you sell, say, a $5,000 product, okay, um, where the 1% rule nicely applies uh, in that, like if you're selling a $100,000 product singularly, the 1% rule probably would apply, probably a fraction of 1%. But let's call it five, a $5,000 product. What you know is roughly 1% will buy, that's 50 people. At a $5,000 product, that's a quarter of a million dollars in revenue. So where it gets exciting is, and you're wondering, well, is the content paying for itself? Well, you work out. Like in David's case, we do we, we craft his email content, we help him out. Let's say you're paying, call it a thousand bucks a month to get the content produced. What's a thousand bucks a month, $12,000 a year. And coming back to you over the course of a year is about a quarter of a million bucks in sales. Well, 12 into 250, it's a roughly 20 to one return on investment. Now we're not factoring in deeper cost of goods of delivery and everything else for your product. It's just a general, you know, risk for reward, so to speak. But you're talking 20 to one. You know, that's that's pretty, pretty cool, right? And more than that, the risk on that's like pretty, pretty damn low. And so this is where the 1% rule really comes to fruition. And this next slide is, I just grabbed this this morning. So this is a company we work with very deeply. Uh, they've been in business for five years. They, they're an eight-figure business now. Uh, and we were, which is really, really cool, the absolute first company they spent money with when they started the company, right? So we've been with them since day dot. What you're seeing here is, uh, these are weekly stats. Across the top, you're seeing the paid media spend. So we're spending about 20 grand a week on ads, it's Facebook, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Google, okay? More importantly, I want to show you the, this is where the 1% rule is. Now I can show you, this plays out time and time again. For this week, we've got 429 leads. For this week, 448. For this week over here, 528. But if you scroll down to lead to sale conversion rate, in this week, 1.4% of leads became buyers. In this week, 2.23 of leads became buyers. In this week, 2.46% became buyers. Now, this is a little bit misleading, okay? Um, I don't want you to think that of these 429, this cohort of 429 people became the 1.4%. That is not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is um, uh, this 1.4%, this lag type, okay? This in reality it, it, it encompasses leads that came in the week before, the week before that, the week before that, and then back months and possibly even years. But, and this is just a three-week snapshot, if I was to grab your quarterlies, you would see time and time again, we're sort of, we're beyond 1% actually, okay? Now, let me qualify this. This is an eight-figure company that has their shit together. They've got a weekly podcast. We, we, we do their content. Actually, we're very, very actively involved in their stuff on the, on the growth side as well. So we work with their media buyers. We do lots of stuff. This is a company that really has their act together with their content marketing. They have a great sales team. They've got talented media buyers for the ads, like all the pistons are firing, okay? And you'll see here, <clears throat> like our, our target's 1.27, but we're routinely are beating the target. So this is where the 1% rule doesn't even apply because we're trumping that. And this is a very, very profitable company. But this is the virtue uh, over here. This is the virtue of the content machine. Because like I said, this 1.4, this 2.23, this 2.46, these sales are not coming necessarily out of this cohort, this cohort, this cohort. In reality, and again, you'd see this if I showed you quarterlies and yearlies, 
these sales are coming from people that opted in and got into the email list weeks and months and possibly even years before. And here's what's freaky. If we were not doing the content, in other words, what it seems most of you guys on the training today are not doing, if we were not following up with great content, we would be making a fraction of this. Now, I don't know what the numbers would turn out to be, maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4%, right? If we were not doing the content, but because we are, we get five times, 10 times as many sales via the follow-up, okay? Another way to say it, there, this is an eight-figure company, right? Let's say all the judicious follow-up that we're making via the content and podcast and so forth is delivering a 10x return, which I think is, is probably modest in this client's case. This eight-figure company would be six-figure company. No, even more, less than that even. Shit, an $800,000 company would be $8 million. It's even less than that. So... I just want to tune in for a second, Alexi, because uh, what, what you've highlighted there, for some people, they're sort of not, not clear um, on what this looks like. But for me, it's really simple, right? What you're saying is you should be spending money on advertising to generate new leads, but those new leads will come in a varying level of buyer interest. Or for most people, what happens is they're hot to buy on the day and then something changes. So who's experienced ghosting from their prospects? Can I just get a show of hands? Those people that, you know, someone says, I'm super interested. And then they vanish off the place of the planet and we're trying to work out what happened, right? The truth of the matter is we don't know what happened. All we know is that uh, we don't get any more communication with them. What Alexi just highlighted here is that if you don't have some level of nurture, those people, you will chase them. And some people use the three strikes in your out policy. I'll ring them three times. If they don't return my call, it's done, right? <laughs> You've, you've seen this before. And those people should be going into a nurture sequence because reality is we don't know what happened. All we know is that they didn't return our call, but they still had intent at some level. So by having this, and for me, it's like funny because as you talk about it, I think, you know, creating content doesn't get more expensive as your database grows, right? It gets, it stays the same price. So whether you send an email to one person or 5,000 people, it costs the same amount to create the content. But for yeah. a lot of people on this call, <clears throat> if they haven't done this before, they're going to get this um, big uptake just from the fact they're starting to nurture people. But there's a fear around, well, if I send stuff out and people unsubscribe, I'm going to lose contact with them. How do, how do you deal with that, that fear around, you know, badgering people? Um, yeah, you're going to lose contact with them. That's okay. They've disqualified themselves, right? That's a good thing. <laughs> So it goes back to, let's go back to this here. Uh, it goes back to meeting the, the, the prospect where he or she is at, right? So the way I framed it before was if somebody enters your world at the I'm not thinking about it stage, so they're just peripherally interested at this stage, you keep in front of them until they upgrade themselves to here, at which point they can be identified as a warm prospect. And they go from here, and when they're ready to go to here is when the transaction happens, Right. But likewise, yeah, if your content, especially if your content sucks and you're mismatching your messaging to your prospect, i.e. the I'm not thinking about folks, you're treating them like they're buying folks and you piss them off and you're trying to get them to buy stuff, yeah, they're going to unsubscribe. So um, here's, here's how I like to think about it. Um, um, put all the, I put the best effort that I can into creating the best content that I can. Hardcore value. The best that I possibly can. And that's what I can control. If people unsubscribe from that, then circumstances are happening in their world that I can't influence. For example, in this case, this person has decided not to invest in property because they'll put their money elsewhere. It doesn't matter where. They're disengaged from the idea. Well, I'm, I don't want to be sending them emails. Let them unsubscribe. It's all good. It's not a problem, right? But if I'm sending good value, which is what I control, right? what I can influence is what I do. Just put your focus into doing the best work that you can and let the chips fall where they may. Now, I promise you, in reality, what happens is you start to get these sort of results, right? When the, when the pistons are firing and everything's happening, you start to get out performance, okay? Now, something else I wanted to mention too, um, I don't have the stat as a screenshot here and I can't show you the funnels because I've given you stats of this company, so I can't tell you who it is. But what I'll tell you is this, of the 429 people that opted in this week and the 448 that opted in that week and the 520 that opted in that week, uh, the lead magnets we use for this company 
are very, very simple. It's opting for a free gift of some kind, whether it's a free report, a free video, something like that. Then on the thank you page, which we're starting this filtering process, we're starting, we're trying to work out where do they fit on this triangle. So on the thank you page, we have an invitation for a 15 minute chat. Let's talk through your goals and your plans, put your details below and we can hop on a call. Now here's what's interesting. At that moment, when they come in from an ad and land on that thank you page, only 5% of people actually take up the request at that moment to have a chat, 5%. That means 95% of people say, no, I'm not ready, okay? But via the ongoing content, via the follow-up, via everything else that we do, within four to six weeks, what we know is 15% of those people are now willing to have a chat. Three times as many. And all it's taken is four to six weeks of ongoing follow-up via email, podcast, yada, 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 right? So what I'm saying is we go up here. So if we didn't follow up and only wanted to speak to like pretty much, you could probably say 3% and possibly the six to seven. So the, the, we're pretty much, if we didn't follow up and only cared about the 5% of people that opt in and say, yeah, I'm willing to chat now, we'd be losing some of these people as well, i.e. the broader market. Now, I only said it's four to six weeks of follow-up. Four to six weeks later, three times as many people raise their hand for a chat. Now, that number starts to multiply again and again and again the further out in time we go. We follow those people up for three months, six months, and a year. Those initial 95% that first said no to a chat or stated differently, the 5% the, the that said yes, that number gets to 25%, 30%, yada, yada, yada. And it's all a consequence of staying in front of them, right? This is the critical importance of following up on content. And so you see something like this. This is one of our surveys for our company. These are people that were requested a complimentary copy of my book. Um, now, look at these leads. Like we sell content services, right? So if you're in B2B and uh, you're wanting like a hot list of prospects, I mean, look how many are, are, are seven-figure businesses, right? None of these people were ready to buy at a moment. All of these are the kind of companies that we want to keep in our world. All or pretty much all of these are uh, probably not this one here, zero to 300, which is not, not a fear. But pretty much all of these, you'd have to want to have rocks in your head to ignore these people, right? Certainly, we would need to have rocks in our head to avoid these people. But none of these are bought on the spot. Some of these ended up becoming clients, right? And all they did was just initially raise their hands for a copy of my book. Okay, you've got the same thing happening here. You are saying no and you are turning your back on, you are ignoring your version or your equivalent of decent quality leads by not having an email list, by not regularly publishing to your social, okay? Now, what you're seeing here, this is the power of content when you really know what you're doing. So uh, a few years ago now, close to 10 years ago, wow, uh, we were living in the States and we had a supplement company with my business partner. And this article here, this was our biggest winner, this article was responsible for about a million bucks a month of sales for about two years. What we did with this article was this was really refined over time. Once this article was refined over time, we started to send ad traffic, ad traffic to the article itself. And what you won't see in the article, because it's now a while ago, is from this article, you click on links further down and you go to a sales page. And because we drove so much traffic to this article and because the funnel that we sent the traffic to was tested and refined over many, 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 many months. Like I said, this, this, this article on its own, rinse and repeat, month in, month out for like 24 months, was responsible singularly for about a million bucks a month in sales. That's something that's like the, 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 the ultimate way to use content is find a way to match it up with ad traffic. But that's a super advanced, that's a super advanced way to to go to a super advanced road to go down. I don't ex expect most of you on this call to be able to do this from the get-go. Just producing a consistent content machine would be a big win, I suspect. 
Uh, another way to use great content, right? So again, like this is where you, if you start to get smart and strategic with your content, uh, amazing things are possible. What you're seeing here is a Facebook ad. The original version of this, its use was as a broadcast email to Sophie's list. This was a content email, okay? So what happened here was we wrote this for the clients and at the time they were sending me their email stats every month and we're just analyzing what's working, what's not and so forth. And this email, this is the rest of the email through here, was a true standout performer. Massive open, rate, massive open rates, massive click-through rates, massive everything. And so I said to the guys, why don't we use it as an ad? And why don't we make the CTA, the call to action, uh, send them to your book funnel where you're selling the book and let's see what happens. What happens? And so we picked up the copy, gave it to the media buyer for Facebook, and they, um, he started running traffic to this ad. And then if you click on this link, this funnel is dead now. This is a couple of years ago now. And this went to a sales page for this book. And this in turn sold thousands and thousands and thousands of copies of books, right? The big lesson I want to give you though, the most important thing is we wouldn't have found this if it wasn't crafted as a piece of content first. We wouldn't have found this if it wasn't broadcasted to the list, the email list. And we wouldn't have found this if we didn't have the presence of mind to analyze what's working. And so when we analyzed what's working and we saw this was a massive standout, we're like, all right, let's amplify it via ads. And subsequently, we're talking thousands of copies of the book. And because, again, this is a different client yet again, this is a nine-figure company we work with because this company produces lots of content, has a big sales team and follows up with their leads. Once someone buys a copy of this book at the time, behind this, we had a $5,000 product that they could buy in Ascension. And behind that was an even more expensive product at the mastermind level that people could buy. So what I'm saying is the knock-on effects, the residual effects of thousands of copies sold of this book were millions of dollars in coaching services. And the seed that germinated was a damn email we sent to the list that my team wrote, a, a content email. How about those ripples, right? This is sort of the, I want to take, get myself off screen sharing. Guys, this is sort of opportunity cost that you guys are all experiencing right now by not doing, by not producing content and not using the content in a strategic way. So all of you have in front of you, now I don't know how big your businesses are, but multiples of what you've got now. This is your alternate reality, your alternate pathway that sits right in front of you that you don't have right now by virtue of not doing some of this stuff. Now, this is not easy to do and to execute on. I'll be the first to say it. It's not as simple as writing the email and sending it. There's this stuff that happens beneath the bonnet, so to speak, infrastructure and operations required, but it's, it's there in front of all of us. Right, if we uh, Alexi, yeah. before you move on, can I just say a couple of things? I, I think what you're touching on here is you're showing some really successful ads. Yeah. But your explanation is they started by someone making a commitment to content writing. And, yeah. and I think if there's one thing that comes out of today for me is that most people are leaving money on the table because they don't know where to start. They don't know if their content's any good. But here's what I know for a fact. Everyone on this call has people in their list that haven't bought from them as of yet. And if you knock on their door with something useful, they will probably read it. And if they're not interested, they will unsubscribe. But if they are interested, they will continue to receive your commentary. But if we don't start this process, because I've seen too many people go, yes, we're going to start writing a newsletter or they start one or two. And after about three months, it drops off. And to me, I look at it and say, well, you know, it's like saying, well, I want to buy the car, but I don't want all four wheels, I only want three. And I'll buy the fourth one when I need it and when I can afford it. And then it's it's just like it's an incomplete marketing system. And so you go, I need more leads. And you go, great. So then I knock on a door and I go and do some lead gen. And then I get these leads and they don't convert. And I go, that didn't work. But in the background, I've got all this trash, which is salvageable content, sal sal salvageable leads. And so I think it's a commitment to content. It's a commitment to working through this. And what you just described with that last email was it came out of that commitment to content. It wasn't, hey, let's write a really good article so that we can make millions of dollars. Mm. It was, let's create content every single week. And then one day you said, hang on, this one was good. 
Yeah. This was just one email of the dozens that we do, we do, we did for them at that time per yep. month. Yeah. <laughs> so look, before you move on, I just want to get a check in from everyone. What's been most useful so far? What have you loved about what Lexi's been talking about? What resonated with you? Or what is something that's sort of stuck out and punched you in the face? Into the chat box. Let's hear some commentary from people. What have they got? Prosper, SEO, simply educating others. Love it. Focus on giving good value. And this value thing is another question that I think we need to raise is what is good value mm. and how do you create it? Um, we'll just let that run through as you keep going through your presentation, Lexi. Yeah, we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about how to get, we'll, we'll get into some mechanics in a couple of minutes. I'm definitely going to reveal some mechanics, guys, so we'll get there. But given that most of you aren't doing anything with this stuff, it was good, and I knew this in advance because I asked David, it's critical for me to show you some of this stuff so the, hopefully the light bulb goes on your mind that you all have businesses that are, have potentially 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 times bigger than what it is now by doing this one thing, <laughs> frankly, the value of this, right? So let's continue on. Um, and so one of the virtues, and this is my good mate, Taki, uh, who we, we craft his content as well, uh, that he posted on on Facebook a while back and I snipped it because it's beautiful. And this, this, this typifies yet another way to think about content. It, it affords you the luxury of working with clients who want you but don't need you. And anyone who's in B2B consulting, coaching and the like knows the best clients are the ones that are going to survive and thrive even without you. They're the ones that we want to work with. We don't often, we don't really want to work with the ones that need us and that are, can barely scramble together the money and yada, yada, yada. We, for whatever reason, just things don't work out all that well with those clients. But the ones that are going to succeed no matter what, and they've got the mental programming already in play, they've got the focus and the dedication, the discipline, you can choose to work with those people and those companies and everything gets much more enjoyable. And so when you are producing content, and you can produce outcomes like this. This is a client, and this is a something that David said before around the, the, con, the cost of the content is the cost of the content. So he, this client here at the time was paying us 2,000 bucks a month to write his emails, right? Now that 2,000 bucks a month was for daily emails. And that cost applied whether his email list was 1,000 names or at the time he had about 50,000 names on the list, right? So he came to us and actually the client's actually a friend of mine too. And I said, Brendan, what are you doing on email? Because man, we're not consistent with it. We're not this, we're not that usual story. So man, <laughs> how many people on the list? 50,000 or so. And you're not crafting regular content. No, so my God, you know how much of a possibility you've got for just like found like leads and prospects on your list. So we got together and we started getting organized with this content and what you're seeing here, this what happened. This this was funny. We started producing the content, and Brendan and the team just get busy running their business, and they forgot that we started to write their content and send it out to their list. And out of nowhere, all of a sudden, and what you're seeing here are book sales, like a sales course, and then Omar's a salesperson, Derek's a salesperson. Out of nowhere, they're trying to work out what the heck is going on here. Why is everything full all of a sudden? What have we changed? I looked at their ads. I looked at this. I looked at that. And then Brendan realized and said, oh, shit, I've, put the, I've pulled the trigger on Fubi and forgot to tell the team. And then he reached out to me and said, hey, man, have you, are you sending the emails? I said, yeah, man, we've been doing it for a couple of days. Oh, okay. And this is the result. And this lasted for months where they were just overwhelmed with sales calls just from the email list itself. Now, 50,000 names on the list. He's put, you know, it's a decent investment in names. That he's cultivated over time. Very, very low hanging fruit situation for all. But this is what's possible yet again when you get serious with this stuff. You know, you can start to work with contents that want you but don't necessarily need you. Okay. So, what I'll do is before I get into some mechanics, I'll answer a couple of questions here because I see a few floating about uh, from Kath. Uh, not doing this is causing a negative ROI. We have two choices to do this and not do this. Put something we are previous. There are previous inquiries sitting there waiting for good value content and a reason to reconnect. Yes, of course, for sure. And I saw a question here. Um, I've heard of the philosophy of one piece many ways. My question is, if we write more email nurture, they convert copy content into social shareables and run this concurrently as a theme, will this amplify results and conversions? Almost certainly it will. The proviso is two things. Your content is not garbage, number one. Number two, um, you know, if you've only got 50 people on your Facebook group, 
or 100 people following you on Instagram, you know, not many people are going to see that. So depending on the size of your following, that's going to absolutely affect how many people see it. But yes, the answer is yes. I'm I'm much more of a fan only because the immediacy of the results uh, are, are really self-evident. You've got a piece of content that's crushing it uh, organically, find a way to run ads to it. Then if you can do that, then you can start to engineer this kind of results that we've been talking. That doesn't mean don't put it on social organically. It's, or get, there's a, definitely a place for organic. Uh, it's just it's a slow burn, especially if you're at the kind of stage, I think most of you are here, where you probably haven't built out your social followings, you don't have the big email list. It's just going to take time. And now with the social platforms, just having so much clutter, and that's going to get worse with the advent of AI and all these tools out there, you can produce AI content. Clutter is just going to get ridiculous if it could get more ridiculous than what it is now. So I'm saying like it's even more challenging now to get the cut through if you haven't built out your following. So I'm much more a proponent of prioritizing winning content and then finding a way to use it with ads. Okay. Alrighty, let's get into some mechanics. All right, creating content itself. So three big mistakes that most people make, certainly I think most people on the training today are making that um, we, I'll show you how to get around. The first is making it difficult for yourself. So I see this happen all the time. People that hate writing go and produce written content or try and produce written content. And then when they give up in a month, um, they're like, I can't do it. It's not going to happen. Don't care for it. Make it easy for yourself. You know, if you like speaking, and most people do, if you like to speak your stuff, speak your content first, right? And we'll show you how to do that in a sec. And then find a way to convert that to written. You know, whether that's like if, if you want to put yourself through it, if you hate writing, write it yourself, get a writer. You know, it's not that expensive. And more importantly, the ROI is there, as I think I've shown in spades here. Uh, big mistake number two, being selfish. Um, guys, so this is where if you can't come up with content ideas, I'm sorry, but you're being selfish. I'll explain what that means in a second. You're thinking of yourself. You're not thinking of your market. It is the easiest thing on planet Earth to come up with more content ideas and you know what to do with if you do what I'm about to show you. And number three, pitching stuff all the time. You don't want to do that. That's that's craziness. And I've shown you with a pyramid earlier that I first learned via, via chat. You, you want to be pitching. You can, pitch, you can pitch aggressively just as long as it's to the right people on, in your world. Otherwise, everybody else should be getting content. All right, so don't be pitching stuff all the time. Now, how to come up with content ideas. I'll show you a few different ways. What you're seeing here is a screenshot from my calendar from a couple of years ago. This was at a time when I was doing many more client consults than I do now. And so you're seeing here, um, like there's a meeting here with Jody on that day. Then further that day, I'm talking to, to uh, Heidi. And then so, uh, for the Tuesday afternoon, I'm talking to Sam Cawthorn. Wednesday, I'm talking to Andrew. These are all clients, right? One great way to come up with content ideas, and this will apply if you guys are speaking directly to your clients day by day. All you've got to do is recall the theme of your meetings. So with Jody that day, what did we talk about? What did she ask me? Oh, Jody wanted to know, um, you know, how do I how do I get more leads via my email list, right? Or Alexi, I noticed that um, uh, Facebook starting to work for me. What's what, what's the next step for me with Facebook? and so on and so forth. You know, I speak to Heidi. Heidi has a, a prop tech platform and uh, she wants to know how to turn her SaaS, use content and, and use her SaaS <clears throat> to get more sales. You know, Sam Cawthon, some of you may have heard of, he trains speakers on how to sell from stage. So whatever we spoke about that day for Sam. So a really, really easy way, if you are speaking to your clientele organically already, just recall conversations. What are they asking you? What are their problems? What are their issues? This is material for content and it's the best shit right because these are your paid clients these aren't tire kickers these aren't freebie seekers these are people that are parting with money they're parting with time you know whatever they're asking you that's the gold of the gold and it's free in fact you're getting paid for the market research because they're clients okay quick easy and you're getting paid right there's one way to go about it now, this I screenshot captured this this morning. This is good because this is of interest to me because where I have my company, right? If Chat GPT can write 10 thought leader articles for you in an hour, is it really thought leadership? 
Like, yeah, that's a good question. What is my market? This is on somebody else's page on Facebook that I'm friends with. We have similar markets. What does my market think on this? I need to know this. This is pivotal for me, right? And my team. And then I, I start to read the replies. Free stuff. No, no. Most people are saying no, bottom line, right? This is market research, right? You can do the same. Become friends with your competitors. Follow your competitors, right? Read their comments when they put stuff out. What's their market? What's their following thinking and saying? Same applies for you. You know, post questions to your Facebook. Like you can do a poll, right? To be honest, I don't even know if Facebook still allows polls. This is a little bit old, this screenshot. But you don't have to do a poll. You can just do it like this, right? If you've got a following on social, ask the question. What is it you guys are, are, What is it you guys want to know around the subject of X? What's the biggest problem you're faced with day by day? I'm thinking of hosting a new webinar. What do you guys want to hear from me? Put it on your social. You can do a survey via email if you've got an email list. Let your market tell you what they want to know, okay? So between something like a poll or a survey or something like reading your competitors' comments to posts they may do, and between something like this, actually listening, like, how's this for a crazy thought? Actually listening to what your clients are asking you on calls, between those, just these, you should have more than enough insight into ideas for your market. And I promise you, when you start to put focus on this, because we all know what you focus on expands, when you start to take notes and start to think, what am I going to produce about content? And then you start to look out for answers you will have the, a different problem. And the problem is going to be you've got too much content. You've got too much, too many ideas. I kid you not. It gets ridiculous. It, gets, it, it goes the other extreme, right? But it requires you to avoid this mistake up here, right? It requires you to avoid that there. Instead of thinking about you, 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 you take, take your you hat off and think about your market. Think about what's, what do they want to get completely unselfish. And when you do, you'll have just more ideas and you know what to do with, okay? So there's problem number one that most people and businesses are faced with. How do we come up with content ideas, okay? Next, how do I produce the content? All right, if you love writing, I mean, I love writing. So for me, it's, it's not a problem for me to write content at all, right? I can happily write an email, take me 10 minutes and it's gonna be really strong, right? but I've been writing for decades and I enjoy it, okay? If that's not you, most people are more than happy to speak their content, okay? So we're talking speaking content. The easiest, fastest way that I've found for most people in most situations is to get interviewed. Now, I've got a camera here. You don't have to be on camera because then that triggers for most people the fear of, I don't want to be on camera. What about the lighting? What camera do I use? And right? You don't have to be on camera. You can do it over a Zoom call. You can turn the camera off you if you want. But my point is simply this. Use Socratic method and just have someone ask you questions. And normally I get the question here, who am I going to ask on a one-man show? Man, get your sister, get your kid, get your cousin, get your brother. It doesn't make a difference. Just Socratic method seems to be the way to be the quickest and easiest for most people to get the content out of their heads and onto a recorded facility. That is most of the work right there, is you're out of your head and into a recorded facility, right? And so something like this next screenshot here. Um, so with my podcast, uh, what you're seeing here is, at the time, uh, my wife was just interviewing me. I just like, we would have a list of things that we're ready to, to cover in the podcast. And because I'm, you know, scarce on time as most people are, um, we just hop on Zoom. I'm in my office, she's in her, her office, and she just fire off questions at me. And I just answer them. Now, I don't need Socratic method because I'll be doing this long enough. I've been on video many and enough times to not even need Socratic. But even, even for me, I was like, the fastest way to get this out of my brain is just have someone ask me questions. So I just got her to ask me questions. Now, since then, my podcast evolved into just me just, just speaking into a mic and just speaking and stuff. That's pretty much just as fast for me. But if you've never done it before and you're stuck at the point of how do I get the content out of my brain? Just get someone to interview you. 
And look, you might as well have the camera on. Doesn't mean that you have to share the video, um, but I would strongly urge you to get comfortable with the video. Um, here's what I did back in the day. God, how many years ago is it now? To 20, 2023 now, might've been 2012, 2010-ish, back in the day when you still had to use an actual camera on a freaking tripod, right? Um, I knew I had to get good on camera. So all I did was just produce a, like a shit ton of videos that no one got to see. That's all I did. I just did reps, right? Until I got to the point where I just felt comfortable. So back in the day, it was brutal, man. One video would take like four hours to record. Like I remember it, right? It would be in our living room, right? Not even a green screen behind me, camera set up. And um, I'd, have, I'd, I'd have a little whiteboard that I jot all the ideas down. I'd have the whiteboard behind the screen, behind the camera, sorry. Man, just the setup took like ages. And then eventually I'd uh, get in front of the camera and then, of course, the first, I don't know, few dozen takes were just absolute cock-ups. It was brutal in the beginning, right? But like anything, continue with it more and more and more, you get good. And to the point now I've done so much of it that, you know, I can present on the topic without any prep. And that's where you want to be. And, you know, the fact is everybody, we all go through that period where we, it, it, we, we suck on camera. It feels awful. You get through that period, then a whole world opens up for you. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll take some questions at this point. Um, are they in your bloopers now? Um, are they in your bloopers now? I don't have any bloopers. Um, but, you know, bloopers are good. I, for, for virality and pass on value, especially if they're entertaining, it's a good content idea. Um, okay, any other questions on this so far? Anything on creating content? I normally have a few on logistics, camera, lighting, anything. Any I'll, throw, I'll throw a couple of quick ones in. Our best rating video ever was the first time we turned the camera on live on Facebook because it was upside down. <laughs> the girl who was working with going, is, is, this, is this running now? Are we live? And I'm going, yeah, I think we are live. And we cut it at about five seconds. Yeah. Then all of a sudden there's a video. Everyone's starting to watch it and laugh and carry on. And it was very, very much a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> but I think a lot of people are scared of creating content. And the funny part about it is so is your competitor and everyone else on the planet. And it's when you decide what Alexi said is you just decide this is just a non-negotiable for me that I'm going to create. If I'm in business, I'm going to create content. And uh, you've just shown us the most obvious things, right? Which is just, just talking about what you do. At the end of every week, you just have a question. What did I do this week? What did I help people with in their business? How do I talk about that? There's your content flow. And uh, you also talked about not pitching. And I think one of the best things we've done is every single email we send out now doesn't have a pitch in it. It has a little PS at the bottom. It just has a little uh, super signature, you, you know, that that sort of, if you're ready, this is how you can engage us. So um, let's see if there's any other questions. And if not, um, we'll get you to sort of bring it home. Yeah. Um, no, no more. Okay, cool. So let's continue. Now, in terms of logistics, the beautiful thing is the social platforms uh, have added legitimacy to the raw video. So don't think it's got to be professional. Something like our iPhone, the quality of the camera, the quality of the camera on these things nowadays, if you just stick in just like AirPods or just a lapel mic down the bottom for sound, even then, if you're somewhere quiet, you don't even need a mic anymore. Good enough, especially on social. So don't get caught up in all the lighting and everything else. It really, especially if it's a bottleneck, to you doing something. If that's stopping you from doing something, well, geez, you just need to start, right? Okay, so you've recorded the content, you've got it out of your brain, I've shown you how to get the content ideas. The next step now, um, look, the quickest and easiest solution to get, a, like you've recorded the content, if you just want it done, get help, okay? So in David's case, we write his emails, he just gets help, pay for help. If you wanna create videos and clips for social, do yourself the favor, get help. Go on to Upwork, hire a company like ours, doesn't matter what. It's not that expensive to create video clips. There's the development of AI tools that are expediting this, but they're still a bit clunky in some cases. The point is the fastest way once you've recorded your knowledge and you've got it on a recorded facility is just get help to get into written form, 
turn them into videos, turn them into quote cards for social and so forth. If you want to do it yourself, that's fine. Your next step would be after recording your material is get it transcribed and you can use a service like otter.ai. We fill up three accounts per month. I think it's like 10,000 minutes for like 10 bucks a month. I don't even know what we pay. It's ridiculously cheap. You put the recording to the platform within five, 10 minutes, you've got a transcript, okay? From a transcript, you can now pull out quotes. You can massage it for emails or whatever, all right? So what you're seeing on the screen here is, uh, I want to focus in on email because it is, it is a critical channel. Don't let anybody tell you that email is dead. It's the opposite of dead. It's those that know, know it's the most profitable channel for them, okay? So Dean Jackson's just a marketer out in Florida who I follow. And most often, I'm reading his emails. What you want to do with your content, you want to get to a point where you send your email and your recipient sees your name in the sender. And because you've over time given such incredible value and you've, you've just done such a good job over time that you've trained them that when they see your name, they're like, wow, whenever this Dean Jackson guy emails me, there's something, I learned something. I'm going to read the email. That is the secret to amazing content. It is over time and an association and a trigger, a positive association to your name where they see their name, they're like, yep, I need to read it and literally drop what they're doing to read your email, okay? That takes effort and time. That's the ideal outcome. Don't worry about open rates. Don't worry about click-through rates. Don't worry about all the stats that you see. Put your focus into training your audience when they see your name that they're like, I love this person's stuff. If you can do that, I promise you there's ROI in your email list. Now, earlier we said don't pitch all the time. Uh, a much more sensible way is if you're going to pitch, find ways to sneak your pitch into your content. Okay, There's a few different ways to do it. Or you can add a PS and, you know, depending on what you're selling, there's your pitch. So in this case, this is for a, a, you know, a mastermind group, a training. You can add it to your PS. If you're selling physical products, you can do we're having a sale on on XYZ widgets, go here for a 25% discount expires in two days, right? You can do any number of things. A PS is a great way to do a pitch after you've done some content, okay? Uh, another way is you can make the entire email an invitation to something. This is a more overt pitch, you could say, um, sure. And it's okay if you are doing, say, three emails a week of really good content, you know, you've earned the right for... You know, let's say you're doing 12 emails a month of really good content to your main list. You've had the right to do a couple of emails a month where you just invite them to something, where you ask them for a, a deeper commitment, an invitation to something, whatever it may be. Okay, something like that. You sort of want a ratio of like 90 10, 90% 90 value, 10% some sort of pitching, something like that. Okay. Another way to go about it is um, you, know, you can post to your social. Again, like I, I was just showing your email back here. You see Taki's case, he's posted this onto his social. And, you know, in this case, he, how many comments did he get? Okay, I probably snagged that a little bit early. Only 10 comments. Normally, he gets hundreds and hundreds of comments to his social, right? But again, if you're consistently putting content onto your social and people are enjoying it, you've earned the right a few times a month to invite them to something, right? Another way to do it is, this is one of our clients, uh, so the rest of this email is all content and, and value and, and stuff. Uh, what this client does is we insert banners, like an overt banner in the body of the email. It's a clear break in the messaging and so forth. And you click on this and you go to a landing page for this, this event. That's another way to do it. And yet another way to do it, this is the hardest, is find a way to integrate your pitch with your narrative. This takes writing chops. Um, I'm just showing you for the sake of showing you. Um, but like, again, you want to be sneaking pictures like this client that no, he's not a client. He's just a colleague. You'll see he's tipped his hand into, you know, adventures in Copyland, his newsletter, but it's part of a bigger narrative here. Like even a compelling narrative about revealing his, why he doesn't reveal his home address. Right. And then it continues on the rest of the body of the email continues on around the narrative around, oops, why he doesn't reveal his address and how he's quite a controversial figure and yada, yada, yada. But then he brings that back to a pitch for adventures in copy land, right? This is much harder than doing all this other stuff, but it's very much a viable way. And this is probably the preeminent way to sell, covertly sell your stuff via content. But that's a skill set.
All right, guys, two minutes to go. <laughs> hey, fantastic timing, Alexi. Um, but for me, like you're just driving home something that I've believed deeply for years. And I think you know, most people, they don't have a CRM. They have emails somewhere. Um, they don't commit to producing content because they're terrified of what to produce and how people will judge them, you know, and they're worried people unsubscribe. So they say, I'm better not to communicate than to communicate poorly. And these are all just little voices, aren't they? Because yeah. in the end, uh, and someone, uh, Glenn said it, we could use outcome sessions for content at times, is something we do, right? Because all I do is I give the guys at Fubi who write my content access to my YouTube channel, and they just watch the videos, and then they go, oh, that's a good that's a good quote. We'll pull that one out. <laughs> and so I don't actually know sometimes what goes out. I just check it randomly because I used to be a control freak. And then what I realized is as long as the content is educational and gives people thought process around building businesses, they'll read it. And so I think you, you said it before, uh, the best thing we ever did was hand over, not the creation, but the publishing of the content. Mm. Because we get bogged down in editing videos. I'm not good at editing videos. I'm not good at you know getting the final send button happening because of fear. And so I think, you know, for me, that, that was a valuable lesson. And I'm a big advocate of, you know, you know lots of stuff. Your customers are craving knowledge. They want to know what's going on in your world. And if you don't give them that education, they don't look at Dean Jackson personal and go, I need to keep that for later. Because every sort of, I think, three out of four emails from Dean is literally valuable insight. And the fourth one is a pitch, right? But sometimes you don't know which one it is until you read it. And it's fine because I'm not offended by that. So this has been really valuable. I just want to get some questions or some top takeaways into the chat right now. We've got another minute with uh, Alexi on the call. This has been amazing, by the way, Alexi. Thank you so much for just sharing the stats. And, you know, you're, you're coming from doing it. Like you've seen thousands of businesses and you've seen the people who are car crashes because they, I oh, know we can't afford to do content yet. We're not ready. And you're saying, well, <laughs> you know, whenever you're ready, we're here. Yeah, we're not ready. Truth is you can't afford not to do content. <laughs> like it's... Mm. You know, anyways. Well, the theme of today has been communication and you, you touched on something with AI. Well, yeah. What, what do you feel AI is going to do? Because now content's going to get noisier. People are going to be producing content faster and less thought process goes into it. But I, I believe the AIs are going to start producing generic content. Yeah, it, it's a tough one. I, I it, A bigger question actually is how are the social platforms going to react to it? Because social is social. Publishing AI content yeah, ain't all that social. <laughs> We want engagement between humans. So it wouldn't surprise me if all the platforms have like an AI content detector and they're out there. They're pretty strong right now. So I think it's going to be an arms race between AI creation tools and AI detectors. And I, I, I reckon there's a decent bet that you won't be allowed to publish um, a lot, if any, AI-driven content to social. I think it's just not social, right, at no. all. It's human to machine. So that's, a, that's, that's one bet that I've got. Um, man, it's evolving so quick. Even GPT-4 is a vast improvement on, on 3.5. So I think there's definitely going to be a case with some of the tools, um, like the video creation tools are interesting. Whether they're allowed to be published on social, I don't know. Amazon has already started penalising AI books already. Uh, now, whether they continue to allow that, I'm not sure. Who knows, man? Uh, my, for my sense, um, you want to get your uniqueness into your messaging right? Mm. Whether an AI, an AI can't do that yet. Whether an AI can do that down the road, I don't know. Uh, for everyone on this call, you need to get your, your act together and just get the, the, the content out of your mind and into a recorded facility. You need to get your uniqueness and unique perspectives out there, right? More than anything, it's costing you a ton of money right now. So, Yeah. I see this has been amazing and we are recording it and putting it into our portal for future reference. <laughs> 